Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! not going in on Brexit today. Uh, there are other things that concern us, but I'll, I'll bring you a couple of bulletins. Uh, Liam Fox's Trade Department is set to axe hundreds of officials who currently promote British exports to countries such as China and Brazil. Um, this is about a 10% cut of trade promotion jobs to go because of a budget squeeze. So while Mr Fox has already hired up to 800 staff to negotiate trade deals, his department is simultaneously cutting officials who already work on the ground helping British companies sell their products in emerging markets. Uh, other Brexit news, 26% now they've counted is the reduction in... Uh, professional European Union citizens coming here to work. That's your kind of highly skilled workers. That's down 26%. And Boris Johnson has decided to use the Daily Mail to announce that he considers a customs proposal that he signed off on as a member of the Cabinet in October. He now considers it to be crazy. So everything's going brilliantly. Four minutes after 11 is the time. And occasionally you do ask me, a couple of people this weekend um, ask me why we don't get to talk to more of these people on this program? Well, the answer is because when they actually get held to account, I'll show you what happens. Something that happened on Andrew Castle's program over the weekend, a rather splendid young chap called Femi, who's made himself something of a regular on this radio program, was um, invited to debate with John Redwood, the, of course, doyen of Brexiters, who in his other life as an investment advisor urged his correspondents to get their money out of Britain not long ago. And, and this is what happens when people like Redwood come up against reality. It was a brilliant highlight over the weekend. LBC's weekend schedule is uh, absolutely bosting. Much better than the dross they've got on during the week. John Redwood is here to help me with all this. A former cabinet minister, considered MP for Wokingham, of course. And Femi is with me as well, co-founder of Our Future, uh, Our Choice. And uh, on the website, it says that this is a group of angry, determined young people who think Brexit it is, is a disaster and should be stopped. <laughs> so there you go. Femi, John, welcome to uh, both of you. Uh, Femi, if I can Hi. start with you um, first and ask you the uh, question, shouldn't we have a preferred option by now and what should it be? Good afternoon. Well, um, hi. Uh, a poll was done that says that three quarters of Brits have no idea what Theresa May wants from Brexit, and that is just exactly what we're seeing right now. We're, we're seeing still, two years after the Brexit vote, we're seeing infighting in the, in the, in the Tory party because they can't decide what position they, they want to go for. And the reason they can't decide for that is because their own experts say that every possible Brexit scenario leaves this country financially, economically worse off which means that right now what they're trying to do is something that they know will harm the country. That makes it official Tory policy to harm the country. So of course they can't find a position because there's nothing that's going to actually be acceptable to the British people. Okay, John Redwood, if you'd like to respond to that, good afternoon to you. Just pause it quickly because I was listening to this and this is the point where even now, after nearly two years, I find myself thinking, come on, Johnny, come on, Redders, give us something because Femi sounds like he knows what he's talking about. And, and here is John Redwood, uh, arch-Brexiter, offered an opportunity to address all of the things I think Femi said that were true. So even now, after nearly two years of an abject failure to come up with a single tangible benefit, I'm sitting here thinking, right, this could be the moment where I can just calm down a bit. Maybe there is a plan. Maybe the Emperor has at least got some, some briefs on, even if he's not covered in ermine and beautiful robes. John Redwood, your opportunity now to tackle the reflection, the reality that this young campaigner has just described. Over to you, John Redwood. Job centres and other support. It's got, to be a, it's got to be a good thing that they're now in work. Lastly, when the government said at the time, work remains... That, that's, not, that's not the right clip. Here's me building up all sorts of magic, playing theatre of the mind, painting castles in the sky, and then we lean on the wrong button. Have we got the right button? Yes, here's John Redwood. I'll respond to that. I wasn't told we were having a debate. You asked me to do an interview on what the options are for our future trading arrangement, and I'm very happy to talk about that. Just refused. Absolutely refused to engage. It's quite incredible. Except, of course, it's not, because he'd be mad. Absolutely mad to try. He ends up looking pathetic, but pathetic is better than disgraced, or dishonest, or utterly, utterly bereft of integrity. 
Eight minutes after 11 is the time. Let's talk about something completely different. Let's talk about the call for a tax on rich pensioners to give the young a £10,000 payout. I, I did a little bit of revision over the weekend on the intergenerational divide. If you were paying a mortgage in 1990, I actually now understand a lot better than I did on Friday why you balk slightly at the suggestion that, that, that young people today have got it really difficult. Because if you had a mortgage in 1990 you would have been paying something in the region of 14% interest on that mortgage. So regardless of, of where you were in terms of deposit and earnings, to have to find 14% um, to pay your mortgage, I think it may even have been higher uh, in, that, in that era, that, that must have been murder. That must have genuinely had people who saw themselves as, as, as winning, saw themselves as homeowners because they had a mortgage, genuinely having to turn off the heating in winter in order to have enough money left at the end of the month to meet those mortgage payments. They were absolutely immense. But you could get a mortgage with a deposit that would be about three and a half times, even then, about three and a half times your annual earnings. You can't do that now. So I'm, I'm moderating slightly my... Uh, irritation by people who, who sort of claim that, that things were just as hard back then. There was a brief window when interest rates were really high where you can argue that things were much tougher than young people today realise. I'd still rather have been around then with a mortgage and an income than being around now with no mortgage and an income and no prospect of raising a deposit. But it's not quite apples and pears. What's apples and pears is when silly people... Uh, sometimes I think through ignorance, but sometimes just through through, through deliberate m manipulation of ordinary folk, uh, claim that if young people stopped eating avocados or, or drinking frappuccinos, then somehow they'd all be able to afford a house. I know a few people in the media who say that, and I can tell you now, every single one of them that I've ever come across has helped their own children to buy a home. It's very, very odd. So when their own children need help buying a home, they don't turn around and say, well, give up the frappuccinos and the avocados. They say, yeah, here you go, my love. How, how, how much shall, shall I make the cheque payable to you or, or direct to the bank? That's what happens. So why they lie to you, I do not know in their newspaper columns. Um, but I do know that the idea that you could somehow change your financial status by eating fewer avocados is about as close to bonkers as we have ever been. And yet, of course, it's mainstream media... Um, morning, noon and night. 11 after 11 is the time. At first glance, even though I, I think I understand the issue, at first glance, I, I find the idea of giving 25-year-olds 10 grand each absolutely insane. They'd put it, I mean, a certain type of 25-year-old would put it all up their nose. Another one might spend it all on a massive holiday. Um, another might sort of buy a, buy a car or a lot of video games. I don't know what 25-year-olds spend their money on these days because they haven't got any to spend. That's the whole point. What would you do if you had 10... I have absolutely no idea. Would you stick it on a horse? Might not be a bad idea. I very nearly backed John Higgins. I was going to put 200 quid on him at 7-2 to two a couple of weeks ago. Not a couple of weeks ago, a couple of games ago. Whew, glad I didn't. Anyway, we digress slightly. This is a report published today that has been, and I want you to take this on board, because it's not some sort of airy-fairy academic. It's been endorsed by the head of the CBI. It's uh, been undertaken and published by the Resolution Foundation. And it talks, if I used the phrase citizen's inheritance, does that become more palatable? Be kind to your kids. They choose your nursing home. It's this sentiment that best sums up some new ideas being touted today, aimed at bridging Britain's yawning intergenerational wealth gap. As millennials struggle with high housing costs, less job security and lower pay, while older people often hang on to substantial sums of accumulated wealth. So is it time for a grand redistribution, including a £10,000 grant to help buy a home? Our political editor Gary Gibbon reports. Metroland, shrine to the homeowning dream. Many of the parents and grandparents of today's 20-somethings could hope to buy in places like Watford. But today's under-30s are struggling with stagnant wages, sky-high property prices and wonder where it will end. It's probably the core worry of people in my age group. I'm 30 next month, so if, if most people if they're likely to be able to buy a house probably have already done so and it's usually through help from parents and um, it, it's the kind of topic I think that's on on the minds of most of the people my age. Do you think the younger generation have got it a bit harder? 
I don't know what happened. Don't know what happened, but it's a lot harder for them. I don't think they've got much future. But I think like back in the day, I think it was quite easy to get a house. For your parents' generation? Yeah, yeah, to be honest. Yeah. It's going to be tougher for you? Yeah, to be honest, yeah, I think. Do you feel pessimistic about being as well off as your parents when you're their age? Yeah, it's going to be harder to get a job, get a job at a house. The average property price around here is now half a million pounds. A 10% deposit way above a young household's entire annual disposable income. What age do you think you'll end up owning a property? Rather than renting. Going, I'll probably say by the time I'm 40, maybe. What age do you think you'll be when you own a house? 30, probably. Yeah, I'm middle-aged, if I will, if I will, yeah. The Resolution Foundation says the wealth locked up in properties like these needs to be taxed more and the proceeds spread around to stop the burden of taxes for NHS, care and other growing demands falling on the younger, struggling workforce. Here's what wealth taxes have been putting into the Exchequer as a percentage of GDP over the last 50 years. You can see that inheritance tax and council tax are doing most of the work. The little strips of stamp duty and capital gains tax. Not much has changed in half a century except for a dip just after the end of the poll tax. Now, look at increasing wealth held around the country. An extraordinarily different story. And most of that is held by the property-owning older generations. Resolution Foundation suggests that wealth needs to be tapped into more by the state to avoid younger, struggling generations being overburdened by taxation. They want inheritance tax done away with, and any inherited money over 125,000 would be subject to 20% tax. Over half a million, 30%. I think where tax is concerned, we all resent it. Let's be honest, whatever the tax is, we, we're going to resent it. But I do think the structure has to change. It has to change. And the Resolution Foundation has a few more changes in mind. Replacing the council tax with a property tax annual levy, just below 1% of house value, even more for some houses in areas like Watford. They also want national insurance levied on pensioners' employment income and on some private occupational pension income. Many Tory MPs said their core demographic of older voters would never forgive such an assault on their wealth. When I was young, got married in the 70s, no, you had to save up for things then. I, you had second-hand stuff and everything, and you save for new. Um, and, you know, so I can't see that there's that much difference between it. It's just slightly different, that's all. The Resolution Foundation found that 20-somethings commute further than previous generations, live in smaller spaces and spend, on average, 15% less. The foundation worries that if heavier income tax was piled on top of everything else, anger could grow and detachment from the political system. Because we do increasingly seem to see an erosion of what we call social capital. It was explained to me by a caller to the programme about a year ago when I was trying to work out what we mean by capitalism in the, in the current context. And a very clever person just pointed out to me, how can you be... It was, in, it was a Corbyn conversation, uh, yet again trying to unpick the way in which Jeremy Corbyn seems to, to offer a, a, a sense of sanctuary to many, many people, especially a, a, of a younger generation. And someone simply said to me, how can you endorse capitalism if you don't have any capital? And I said, what do you mean? And they said, well, my generation will not be able to buy a home in, in, on, on a scale that is incomparable to previous generations. We're living in an era now, for the first time in living memory, people are going to be worse off than their parents. So if capitalism and, and these slightly oversimplified concepts like capitalism and Marxism and or socialism are being bandied about more than that they have in recent years, but if capitalism is the modus operandi of a country, why are we doing this? Well, because we're a capitalist country. And a majority of the upcoming workforce will not have a capital stake in that society because they won't own their own home. Something's going to break. And if you then factor in the conversation we were having in the last hour about social capital, which again was a phrase I've only recently come to properly understand, that means that you don't mind paying your taxes and going to work every day and contributing to society, because even though you're not going to be able to afford to buy a home, because it's never been the case that everybody can, you're not going to be able to afford to buy a home, you'll reward the social contract, as it were, 
is social capital, so you know that you're not going to get stabbed in the street because there's lots of police officers that are being paid for out of your wages. You know that if you get poorly, you're going to be able to go to hospital because there are lots of doctors and nurses that are being paid for out of your wages. You know that the schools to which you will one day send your children will be safe and fresh and happy places. How many of those three statements are true in 2018. So if you are a millennial, which means you were born between 1981 and 2000, and if you are um, just bored now of hearing old people tell you that you need to eat fewer avocados, and you're actually looking at your future, what social capital are you getting in return for your contributions? And remember, you're looking down a long, long, long and lonely road when it comes to your working life. You're not going to have the kind of protections that my parents would have expected when they went into the workplace. The notion of a job for life has gone out of the window, but the notion of a job that comes with protections is now as rare as hen's teeth as well. You don't get the uh, pension, you don't get the trade union protection, you don't get the redundancy, you don't often get any terms and conditions at all because you're signed up, if not on a zero hours contract, then on some sort of rolling freelance basis. That means the employer has no responsibility to you but you have the responsibility to turn up every day and earn money for the employer. The balance of power has shifted so enormously in the course of the last few years, but it's shifted incrementally, so most of us haven't noticed. Millennials have noticed. They have noticed that they have responsibilities to employers and to society, but employers and society increasingly have no responsibility towards them. Now, that didn't matter when they could afford to buy a home because their capital was concrete, literally, bricks and mortar. In a society where their capital is going to be largely social, police, health, protection, education, and that is diminishing daily, as everybody agrees, why should these young people keep their responsibilities in place? Why should they keep up their side of the bargain? I don't know. 0345 So when the CBI and the Resolution Foundation combine to suggest that pensioners who own homes should pay a little bit more council tax and if they're still working they should pay national insurance contributions and that would enable a £10,000 citizen's inheritance to help young people get on the housing ladder or gain skills. I think you need to know 25 year olds to know whether this would work. And I think it's a huge mistake to do what I did when I first saw the headline and imagine 25-year-old me. Because 25-year-old me very blithely presumed that he'd be a homeowner by the time he was 30, and he was. 25-year-old me very, very arrogantly presumed that he would see his earnings increase on a fairly steady gradient from that age to this age, and I have. 25-year-old me very, very, very foolishly thought that there's no earthly way a government would ever preside deliberately over a shift of wealth from ordinary people like me and my family to incredibly wealthy people like Jacob Rees-Mogg and his family, but they have. So I think I like this idea, but I have to concede that I don't know that many 25-year-olds. What do you think? 0345 6060 I'm looking at two people now who are considerably younger than me, and I'm fairly confident that if they received a £10,000 citizen's um, inheritance, they would spend it responsibly, wisely, and not necessarily immediately. And, and uh, I've kind of done something I usually criticise other people for. This, this £10,000 citizen's inheritance comes with caveats. It's a restricted use asset endowment to all young adults to support skills, entrepreneurship, housing and pension savings. So you have to show them what you're going to spend it on before you get it. Um, so anybody who's currently on hold waiting to complain about the fact that they'd spend it all on sweets, uh, I, I apologise. I, I, I have added to the misleading that has been deliberately undertaken already with regard to this story in some newspapers. Um, I think I like it. And I think I like it because I think being 25 today is incredibly different from what it was like when I was 25. And I think people 20 years older than me, as opposed to people 20 years younger than me, have probably had the best deal that society is going to offer anybody for the foreseeable future. 03456060973. I'd remind you before we open the phones of the words of uh, Edmund Burke, who said, society is a contract between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. This report by the Intergenerational Commission suggests that the contract between the young and the old, the, the social contract, if you will, is under 
threat. I, I was going to add the word mortal, but I'm actually quoting the report. So it's under threat, but I say mortal threat because it sounds a bit more Game of Thrones. Martin's in Ashford. Martin, what do you think? Well, you know, um, just listen to what you're saying obviously, in regards to, say, the new generation and the old generation. I think the 10 grand, you're basically saying like a 10 grand grant or like sort of the millennia. Um, I think it should be more something towards like something uh, like, more like a house as such. To like get you on the property ladder. Yeah, it would. This is. I'm sorry, mate. This is my fault. I should. I just, so here it is. It's a restricted use asset endowment, uh, okay, which would yeah. be available to all young adults to support skills, entrepreneurship, housing, and pension saving. So you don't just turn up with a bucket or a wheelbarrow, no, that's, that's and they fill it up with pound coins, and then you wheel it home again and and and, and call dominoes. No, I, I think that's spot on, really. Because if it was just like say as loan as such, I think as you say, quite a few twenty-five year olds would just. Get, you know, just flaunt it and have a luxury life for a couple of months. Some might, but, and, and, and you, but, but that's not that's not on the table. That is obviously we realise now as we talk that that's exactly what the Daily Mail and others will will pretend is going to happen in order to nix the idea that that people who've got quite a lot of money should help out people who haven't got any, but who are facing forty years of of work to keep society afloat. Sell it to me though. Imagine I was sixty six and I had a face like a side of yep. gammon, and I found the idea of you getting ten thousand pounds out of my, you know huge endowment fund, I found it absolutely obnoxious because when I was young, I worked extremely hard and young people today spend all their money on avocado pears and pumps. <laughs> well, for one, I don't eat avocado. Well, that's why they say frappuccinos then. <laughs> I work six days a week and um, I know full well at the minute I can't afford to uh, buy a house. I'm struggling at the minute just to save because I think living in cost now is absolutely ridiculous. Wages aren't increasing quick enough. Like House, house prices like are just gone through the roof and just like the average um, deposit we'd need now is about 30 grand just to get an average flat or yeah. two-bed house. It's just, it's impossible to get that savings aside where someone like me, I've actually still got a uh, rent property now and then obviously trying to rent and save it is, it is well, you're, 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 But you are paying a mortgage. This is the thing. This is the, the two big myths about housing in this country. One, that there's a housing yeah. shortage. There isn't. There's millions of empty houses. There's no oh, housing exactly. shortage. And two, that, 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 that you can't afford to pay a mortgage. You can afford to pay a mortgage. You're just paying someone else's because what you can't afford to do is correct. save up a deposit. That's correct, yeah. Yeah, because you've still got to live at the end of the day. You've still <laughs> got to make sure you've got food on the table. Yeah, as long as it's not avocados. Oh, God, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Living on caviar. Yeah. But like, I, I always see quite often, like, you got, like, like you say, there's loads of empty houses. I'd be quite interested in buying an old house and re-renovating it for myself. Well, of course you would. And, you lot, so, and that's the kind of thing that would help. That, that's what this would help yeah, you yeah. do, you know? It would look at, look at your plans. And, and, and the problem is, who would vote for this? Because it would involve asking people in their 60s and older to vote to be poorer, so that people like Martin can have a stake in society. This is, I, I, 25 minutes after 11, I mentioned a few times that I'm doing a lot, a lot of writing at the moment, eight and a half thousand words in three days, doing a lot of writing at the moment, and I, I thought when I started on this project that some of the things I was beginning to worry about would dissipate and fall away, and I'd, I'd sort of look more into subjects and dig into it and not actually conclude that, um, that, that things are moving in a very ugly direction. And yet, the more we look at it, and the more we talk to each other, and the more we focus our conversations on people who are living the story rather than people who are simply observing it from the sidelines without having any real understanding of the issues whatsoever, or people in my line of work in newspapers who deliberately lie to ordinary families about what's responsible for their declining circumstances, the more I look at it, the more worried I'm getting. 26 minutes after 11. Annie is in Orpington. Annie, what do you think? Oh, hi, James. Hello, um, first of all, can I just say, I buy the wonky avocados from Morrison's. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, but still, mate, I don't know what's wrong with <laughs> turkey twizzlers. Oh, well, I'm a vegetarian, so that's no good. Oh, thing. you are a vegetarian. That's why you can't afford a house. You're spending all your money on vegetables. Well, clearly it is. That's, that's the only reason. Um, I'm, I was just called in today. I'm 28. Yeah. Um, my husband's on very slightly above average income. Um, we've got two children. We've got a seven-year-old, a four-year-old. Um, my youngest is severely disabled. Um and we rent our house. We've got no savings whatsoever. We're really good with our money. Um, we, I got married when I was 18. Mm. Um, so we've been together, uh, like, been married 10 years. And in that time, we've still not got savings because the cost of living is so expensive. And I don't think we'll ever be able to buy a house. With regards to this 
£10,000, um, whether it's a good idea or not, I think whether, I'd have to see like, how they would actually work it out and everything. But I just think if it is to do with helping to buy a house, £10,000 where I live in Alpington, it's, that's not even a quarter of a deposit. No, but it's £10,000 more than nothing. It is, and and I definitely it wouldn't be squandered in our hands like whatsoever. It would go into an account. Where we I think I think this is, and I, I'm 46, so I like I like the 20 year increments here. So you've got 86, 66, 46, and 26. I think that I'm at the end of the era who look back and think, what are they moaning about? It's, I mean, I, I don't do that because I have the privilege of talking to people like you every day and I pay attention to what my younger colleagues are telling me. But if I was a little bit more myopic and I had some better fitting blinkers, I'd be able to sit here and pretend that the experience for someone who's 26 is identical or very similar to what it was like when I was 26. It obviously isn't. I told that all the time, James. There you I've go. Got, I've got friends on Facebook who uh, are a lot older than me. I go to a church, so I've, I'm friends with like people from all ages. They're really nice people, but the, but when this comes up, and I will often share like your um, viral clips on mm. Facebook, and people are like, well, it, it was exactly the same in my generation, um, but we managed to scrimp and save. We worked hard. Yes. Well, actually, we worked really hard as well. Of course, well, harder, actually, because exactly. you're getting you're getting less in return. Time, so the the equation I mean, is, is skewed against you, and that, and that the 66 person is more likely to be like that than the 46 person. Yeah, I am talking about people around that age. Yeah. Um, and I'm not. I, I'm a full-time carer to my son. He's quite severely disabled, and I'm not even going to have a pension when I get old. So I, I, I really I try not to think about it. But when it when I do find myself you know, thinking yes. into the future. I'm, I'm quite worried about it because I don't know what we're going to do. We, we, we're well, this proposal to... here w addresses some of the things you describe. It's not just a £10,000 citizen's inheritance. There'd be £2 billion more for social care from, from a reform taxation of property. Um, there'd be a £2.3 billion NHS levy via national insurance being introduced on the earnings of those above the state pension age. Limited national insurance on, on occupational pension schemes. So the political challenge that I can't really see any political party rising to. The political challenge is to persuade people who are older, who don't feel that they're in clover, they certainly were expecting in many cases to have a more comfortable retirement than they're currently having, but to make them A, realise that they are and have lived in considerably more comfort than the upcoming generations, and B, persuade them that they should somehow put their hands in their pockets, albeit via you know, taxation and, and, and legislative frameworks to help people like you. And I don't know that that's ever going to happen in Brexit Britain. I just, I, I think, I wish they, they would do something. I know it's people think it's really irresponsible, but if they brought back 100% mortgages for people who've been paying rent even for 10 years... And yeah, use, use your rent, you, yeah, yeah, simple but, and, but effective. Yeah. Use your rent record as a form of, of financial reference. Exactly. Um, and, then, and then the older generation haven't got anything to whine about either. No. And don't get me wrong, I, I've got so much respect for older people and actually I know that some of them have lived through like rationing and things like that. It's not they haven't worked hard, but it's also the, just having the recognition that it, it's not easy for us no. and it's not as easy. In well, that's way. all you want. And, and then I just to randomly pick a complete buffoon off Twitter, here's someone called Christopher Tymon who says, if you're so unhappy and scared of living in the UK, leave. There's Brexit for, well, let me check. I don't want to be unfair. Let me see what his views are on Brexit. Yeah, no, fair, fair enough. Uh, he is a typical Brexiter. So there's, there's your answer. There's your society. There's your social contract. That's what your husband's paying his taxes for. Because when you turn around and say, this just isn't fair, post-Brexit, Britain's response will be, well, if you don't like it, why don't you leave? To which you can say, well, I can't, because you lot abolished freedom of movement. Oh, yeah, it's... Do you know any jokes? Uh, none that are clean for radio. All right. Sorry. Well, I'll give you one. How, how, how old is uh, your oldest? Seven. Seven. This is for the seven-year-old, right, when he gets home from school tonight or when she gets home from school tonight. You ready? Yeah. What's What's this? <gasps> Don't know. What is it? Pair of pants. I don't get it. Polite giggles. You need to listen back to it on the podcast. It's 11.31. Okay. Um, it, it, it's very, very fruitful, isn't it, this thing that we've managed to build together over the last few years, where we can have really interesting conversations beyond the headlines. Um, not a criticism of anybody who prefers to focus on the headlines, 
but you don't learn anything by focusing on the headlines. I'm learning stuff today. And these proposals from the Resolution Foundation about trying to bridge the intergenerational gap, um, they're fascinating because there's stuff I didn't realise that I don't fully understand. So here's, here's a good one. In terms of jobs, moving jobs, if you want to get a big pay rise, you need to move jobs usually. Or, or you need to get an offer from outside which you take back to your work and say, look, this is what they've offered me. If you don't match this, um, I don't really want to leave, but obviously I've got bills to pay. My kids need shoes, uh, and, and they're prepared to pay me that. So any chance you could kind of match it or possibly even beat it to show how much you love me? Uh, I appreciate that, that the less skilled you are as a worker, the less leverage you have in that sort of scenario. But why would somebody born in the millennial era, 81 to 2000, be considerably less likely, 20 to 25% less likely to move jobs than my generation at the same age. But little things like that, they're statistically true. They've, they've counted. But I can't, because I don't live in that generation, I don't quite understand why that would be. Is it because if you feel less secure in your job, you are psychologically less minded to cast around, to look around? Is it because there are fewer opportunities or because job security has been eroded in such a way that means that people don't have to pay more to poach you because you, you, you've got no... Um, I wonder if that's part of it. But then that you could argue that that made it easier to move because you didn't have pension contributions and long service scenarios and redundancy on the horizon or anything like that. So you could move. So I'll do that as a why in this hour, as a side order to the central question about the £10,000 citizen's inheritance. Why, why would somebody in my generation be 20 to 25% more likely to move jobs than somebody in your generation? We'll open this one up for the millennials. And, and for the avoidance of doubt, officially, if that's the right word to use, uh, officially a millennial is somebody born between 1981 and the year 2000. I belong to Generation X, a phrase which I, I think was coined by the American writer Douglas Coupland, which means I was born between 1966 and 1980. So someone born between 66 and 80, basically the World Cup to Margaret Thatcher, is 20 to 25 percent more likely to move jobs and therefore secure a big pay rise? I don't know why that would be. Hannah is in Burnley to talk about the citizen's inheritance. What do you think, Hannah? Hi. Um, I just want to say I think it is a really good idea. Um, I'm are you are you under 25? Yeah, I'm 23. <laughs> um, and I think that people can say they just. I know you can't spend it on anything, yes. but we'll waste it. But um, I'm coming at this because I've just bought a business premises. I'm Gosh. just setting up on my own. Um, and I'm 23, so pretty young to be doing it. Yeah. Um, now, to buy this business pre um, premises, I have to find a 30% deposit, which anyone will have to do if they want to buy a business premises. Right. Um, and I am unbelievably lucky and extremely thankful, and I know that I'm lucky in that my mum and dad helped me out unbelievably. Why do you think you're lucky instead of somehow you, you're the logical beneficiary of your mum and dad's hard work? Because I think you're lucky. I think I'm incredibly lucky. Mm. But I, I meet people often who, who don't think they're lucky at all to have been born at the right end of history. Mm. Well, I think I'm lucky because... In contrast to my friend's yes. parents, they're not in a. It was forty thousand pound they had to give me. Yeah, it's not. It's not small change. No, but I'm, this this Reese Moggian argument that that does gather pace among people who who would never be able to get their hands on forty thousand pounds in a million years, and the Donald Trump. Uh, paradigm in America, that this sense among poorer people that rich people somehow deserve all their money. It has nothing to do with luck. And, you know, if the cards fell differently, except that great line I overuse on the programme about there being no such thing as poverty in, in Depression-era America, just temporarily frustrated millionaires. I'm just interested psychologically in why you recognise that you're lucky when other people in your position would claim that that it's yeah. not luck at all, it's a form of natural selection or something similarly sinister. Well, I, I don't expect it to be handed to me. No, I, I know you don't. And it's, it's for business, you know. You're not like you're going on holiday. You haven't bought a boat to go cruising yeah. around the Azores. 
it took really um i kind of refused it for quite a while because i wanted to be able to do it on my own yeah. and i wanted that sense of doing it on my own i didn't want to rely on my parents anymore but it would have been impossible without them just simply couldn't have happened that's the point isn't it yeah, yeah. So even if you, and I hope you do go on to be a, a, a business a titan, you would never have got on the bottom rung of that ladder if mum and dad hadn't had 40 grand to, to spare. And people say, well, I could have rented, which is a fair point. I yeah. could have rented, but it's dead money. And it, it's... Well, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it, it, yeah, it's having one, one arm tied behind your back. It's the same as the domestic, as the, as the property to live in rather than to work in. You'd be buying it for somebody else. Yeah, yeah, and it would have cost me a fortune just to get get it built up, get the decorations done and everything yes. like that. It still still would have cost a lot of money. So I think having that ten thousand pound at twenty five and saying his yeah, with terms and conditions attached, you you don't you don't yeah, get to spend it all on sherbet dib dabs. Yeah, but I, I don't think I, I know. Or I can only speak from like myself and my friends. Yeah. If we were handed ten thousand pound, the last thing I dream of doing is wasting it. Yeah, the big thing for me, uh, the, the, in terms of trying to understand people your age from the perspective of being exactly twice your age, was when I read about students being really, really cross when lecturers don't turn up, and I thought something huge has changed in the last twenty-three years. Obviously, tuition fees are like eighty percent of the explanation for this, but that 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 just reminded me that people living in the same country that I was living in 23 years ago are actually living in a completely different country from the one I was living in 23 years ago, or at least a completely different society. Can I ask what, what business you're, you're going into? Um, it's, a, it's a cake shop, so wedding cake. Definitely. Fantastic. Well, when, when you want to plug, let me know, all right? <laughs> it's called Bella's Bakes. There we go. Bella's what? Bakes. Bella's Bakes. Bakes. I like it. And yep. it's based in Burnley. It is, yeah. You're fond of alliteration, are you, Hannah? I am. Bella's Bakes, based in Burnley. I like it a lot. <laughs> let, them, um, let me have a website or something like that, and I'll read it out later. Send me an email. 11.44 is the time. Let's squeeze in Jake, who's in Manchester. Jake, what's going on? Um, well, thanks for having me. First time caller. You're very welcome. Um, Whereabouts in Manchester are you? I'm just. I'm actually between Manchester and Burnley, so oh, I'll okay. Bella's Bakes in a little bit. You will. Check out Bella's Bakes, mate. Seriously, they're going <laughs> places. Macaroons. Carry on. <laughs> um, yeah, just wanted to say a couple of things, actually. Firstly, on the £10,000, it, it can only be a good thing. Yes. Um, I just bought a first house um, with my girlfriend, um, both, well, 24 and 25, um, so obviously we'd, we'd potentially benefit from that 10000 But even if I wasn't, I think even... Uh, the point I was making to, to, who I was, to your research was if it was spent on not entirely positive things, so yeah. drinking or meals out or whatever it is, it's still in the economy, it's still an in injection, Gosh, and, yeah. and that will then multiply and, and it benefits. So the multiplier effect is something you, you learn the first year you, you study in business or study in economics, and it's something that it can't be overlooked. I think even, obviously... It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because yeah, yeah, that's a really nice point, because proponents of what they call trickle-down economics claim that if you give everything to the tiny number of people at the top, then some of it will trickle down to us. But yeah. actually, <laughs> divvy it up a lot more fairly among everybody, and the economy will be much healthier, because we will go out and spend it, rather than just sitting there watching it grow. Yeah. I'm talking about money. Yeah, no, no. Um, <laughs> and, and what we... I, I, I was remembering back to my, my early years in A-level economics, and one of the teachers said, I can't remember the exact country, I think it was Japan, they gave the equivalent of a £1,000 to, to everyone under, I think it was 20. Oh, yeah. Um, and this was in the 90s or something like that. Again, that might be wrong. I might have got the country wrong sure. a long time ago now. But it was a great thing, and obviously it had these endless benefits, and these people weren't told what to spend it on, and there were no caveats or anything like that, but it benefited the economy. Yeah, well, it would. Um, it would because they are demonstrably more likely to spend it than a, than a, somebody at the other end of their life. Briefly, yeah, um, yeah. why do you think your generation is less likely to change jobs than my generation? Yeah, so I think there's, a, there's quite a few reasons, to be honest. Um, the, the job market itself for young people, there's an endless conveyor belt of well-educated, driven, motivated young people looking for jobs. If you want to leave and your management get sniff of that, yeah. you can fill your position in a blink. But it's not just that, it's... If I've got a CV and I've been in role for a year, which as a young person is probably when you're going to start looking for a new role to, to get yes. that, you want the money as soon as possible to try and save for a house. 
then you're going to go to another job and they say, you've only been there for a year. Right. Whereas I've got this guy who's been here for 17 years. He's my sales manager. He might not be great at his job, but he's been there for so long that he's got his feet under the table. And, it, and it's a negative on your CV. I think just the, the, oh, the, the still. fact that I see, the so, yeah, so the, different for young and old people. The record hasn't talk, caught up with the changing reality. I hadn't thought of that. Brilliant answers, actually. I, I, I can patronise him enormously now as I say goodbye. What, inter what, what a bright young man. Where we continue to examine some of the proposals put forward today by the Resolution Foundation. They seek to address the real and present danger of a generational divide, a breach, I think it's fair to say, of the social contract between the young and the old. Um, and it's linked to almost every aspect of our existence, uh, not just economically speaking, but socially, because your job, your income, your health, your future, your residential status, uh, where you live, how you pay for it, all of these things seem to be knitted together, and yet the idea that we need to somehow rejig the system to recognise that the people we are increasingly asking to keep the economy afloat for an ageing, increasingly poorly population are less staked in that society than the people that they're being asked to essentially look after. And there's nothing wrong with that. That, that is the way it works. There's another great line. Gave you that Edmund Burke line. Rachel Sylvester writes about this quite beautifully in the Times today. But, but the notion of the cradle to the grave, uh, the, the generations support one another from the cradle to the grave. It's like a constant circle that never stops turning. But it will stop turning if, if one end of it is considerably heavier than the other end of it. And that seems to me to be where we are, which is why I like some of these proposals. 11.52 is the time. Mick is in Brentwood. Mick, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, OK, so I'm, I'm, I'm 58 and I'm definitely not in the 25 generation anymore, but uh, I don't think... I think it's absolutely outrageous to say that they don't work as hard as us. I think they, they actually... Well, where where, where, where do you work. think psychologically that argument comes from? Because it's so obviously uh, offensive and wrong. What, why would anybody bother making it? What do they achieve by making that argument? I, I got, I've got my particular... I don't know, James, where no. that comes from exactly. But, uh, but my take on it is... I remember I was 19, 20 when Margaret Thatcher got, you know, in, won her first election. And I, I remember within two years thinking, this is going to end up in tears if she sells all the council mm. stuff. Off. This is going to end in tears. And for years and years and years, my mate said, no, Mick, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, you need to get on the property ladder and bloody, bloody, blah. And I just, I, it, I couldn't explain it. I couldn't justify it. I didn't have the um, economic language, as it were, to, to say what I, but I felt deep, deep, deep down that it was going to end in tears. And now it has ended in tears because the one thing that, that and, and even Jeremy Corbyn doesn't want to talk about it. It's like, guys, build council houses and they'll go and this is what they'll do james they'll go oh where's the money coming from i'll say the, the money is going to come from the from the, well where did 460 billion of quantitative easing that was given to the city come from don't tell me about your magic money tree because that's just mythology you can always find money for a war yeah and you can find the money for and by the way here's the thing james if you do that, yeah. then the housing benefit welfare bill is going to drop massively. So if the Daily Mail are worried about benefit scroungers, I would tell the Daily Mail, OK, Daily Mail, you want to talk about benefit scroungers, what is buy to let except the offer that, hey, by the way, guys, get, get a benefit scrounger, quote, yeah. to buy your house for you. <laughs> You're very good. I have to tell you, you know that there's a seat coming up, don't you? A what? A, a seat in Lewisham, mate. <laughs> oh, Heidi Alexander's just announced that she's stepping down. <laughs> I, think, I think you're in the wrong job, Mick. Well, OK. <laughs> it's not too far away, is it? For you? With five kids, James. I, can't, I, I... <laughs> I, no, I hear you. No, I mean, the thing, I, I, you were a bit ahead of the curve, I think, with the right to buy, but it, what I didn't understand until relatively recently is is how, how little was replaced. So you can sell it off as much as you want if you then use the money to build more and, and build more well, modern... Promise, James. And that they never delivered. Promise. They didn't deliver, and nor did the. Nor did the and, and I remember voting for Tony Blair in the hope that finally we were going to get a return to the Atlee Bevan philosophy. Mm. And uh, what did I get off Tony Blair? I got Tory Light. 
You did, I think. I, I think he's slightly maligned. Uh, he did a little bit more good than perhaps people have minded to give him credit for at this point in time, but that's not a bridge I'm going to die on. I, I just look yeah. at the... But they, they, why, why, though? I mean, if, even if they did build loads more social housing, and part of the problem there, as I understand it, was a shift in the law in about the mid-'80s that, that, that barred councils from borrowing even to build. Right. So what we've had is 30 and years... Also, sorry, James, and also no, the other thing on. that they did... In the, it, sorry, James, the other thing they did in the 80s, I remember this very well, I was in a bed sit. Um, and I was paying my land, it was 88, 89, I was paying my landlord 60 quid, and my mate said, you know the rent, uh, rent control's still in force, don't you? So we went down to the, um, to the council, or wherever it was, well, and we got it put back down to 30. So the rent control prevented the rents from rising. And, of course, if you that. prevent the rents from rising, then you are going to stop this housing bubble from continually, ex you know, bubbling, 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 bubbling. It's worse than we thought then. So last hour, last hour I was sceptical about the idea that the decline in policing could be deliberate or ideological and police officer after police officer after police officer queued up yeah. to tell me that they believe yeah. it really is. Now yeah. you're telling me that the, that the housing crisis that we're facing um, is the direct consequence of, of, of decades of essentially conservative ideology. party policy and ideology. Ideology. It's ideologically driven. Absolutely. And does it boil down to, if why you've the got Germans, capital... Why are the Germans and the French happy great. with renting? Seriously, get Lewisham on the phone. All right. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me know if you need any help. Actually, I was going to say, if you need any help speech writing, but I don't think you ever would, Mick, to be no, honest. I think, I, I think, I think, Dan, I think you will, you will shoot at me there, James. Yeah, I, 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 I'll stick in a few words that nobody understands, maybe, mate, but I don't know if that's a vote winner. Mick, what a lovely conversation. Thank you. Dan's in Wakefield. In uh, Well, you know where Wakefield is, West Yorkshire. What would you like to say, Dan? Hiya. Um, first time I'm putting in. Very welcome. And... Um, yeah, I, I'm 28, so I remember what it was like being 25. Back then, I didn't have a full-time job. I was going between job and job because it was part-time. They don't like to give you very long. So no, but remember that today they can announce that the number of jobless households has gone down because people like you have been essentially squeezed into insecure temporary labour. Yeah, I mean... I'm not going to go into that topic because no. that's a whole winding up. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Go on. But, um, yeah... So I was living at home with my parents because I wasn't going to move out and put myself into a state of debt. And the only people I've seen around my age that have been able to buy a house so soon are people that have actually been able to get the help from the parents. Yes, of course. Or of a course. wealthy friend. Yes. Um, Which is why right-wing journalists are so comfortable with the idea of this millennial malaise because they know that they can sort their own kids out. Yeah. So that, that, and they lead the news agenda. They lead the narrative. So you open up the Daily Mail. Why are they all eating avocados and drinking frappuccinos? And you know full well <laughs> that the, the, the people writing that rubbish will be able to help their children out. I think as things carry on as they are, I'll be able to help my children out. But I'm not going to pretend that that is a good thing. It, it, it makes them lucky. It doesn't make you undeserving. The avocado and, and, and latte and frappuccino thing, it makes me laugh because it's just... The idea that, oh, yeah, they're just... They're just <laughs> it would make me laugh. They're, they're, they're draining the money instantly. It's like, no, I, I, I shot that Aldi. I can only kind of blow budget stuff. So I have yeah, but I bet you've got a mobile phone. I bet you've got yeah, a mobile phone, haven't you? Because it's not realistic to not have one. Look, shut up. It's cool. Well, you can afford a mobile... Is your television flat screen? <laughs> I didn't buy it. I didn't, it got, it got, got a flat screen I'm television and a mobile phone and he's complaining about not being able to afford a house. <laughs> Have a look at yourself, Daniel. Have a look at yourself. <laughs> it, I, it's priceless. It's well, it is, except I don't understand why. When people come out with crud like that on Question Time, it isn't greeted by a Daniel-flavoured guffaw that sweeps through the entire auditorium. It's absolutely insane. And the people of my age and older who go along with it are literally kebabbing their own children upon the altar of a false ideology designed solely to redistribute wealth. The little bits of money that we've got, and I speak as a, as a child of a middle-class home, the little bits of money that families like mine have managed to accrue getting hoovered up now because it'll all go in care home fees or it'll all go in uh, my private police subscriptions that I'll have to pay because the coppers on my uh, patch are disappearing at a rate of knots due to cuts. And, and eventually, I don't know how anybody can be still resisting the idea that the politics we've seen in this country over the last eight years has been deliberately designed to take money away from people who haven't got much and put it in the pockets of people who've already got plenty, i.e. enough to buy a deposit. I